Hello everyone and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 30th of June, hasn't time flown by and it's been so long since we've been able to get together to delve into the ancient world in one of our Q&As. But uh, thank you for your patience while I've been away on things like jury service, although I can't tell you any more about it. I'm afraid I'm not allowed to discuss the cases that we were looking at, um, but it is a great pleasure to be back with you today. And you may notice that this is a slightly different location than you have seen before that I am broadcasting from. Yes, I am coming live from the University of Warwick, from the Department of Classics and Ancient History in our wondrous new Faculty of Arts building, and particularly from our antiquities room. So you probably guessed it, it does what it says on the tin because you can see behind me, yes, this is the University of Warwick Classics Department Antiquities collection that you can see in these fantastic cabinets. And you're seeing through the glass to the outside wall to the corridors behind me. So you may see some people going past in unintentionally on camera in this broadcast, um, but so that we can have our antiquities collection on display to the wider world here at Warwick and to the student community. One of the joys of this room since we moved into this new building is working and studying in this room with students, but actually just seeing all the students come by from whatever subject background they might be uh, studying, coming by, taking a look and getting involved and looking at some of the ancient pieces. So we've taken the collection that here at Warwick was previously sort of within a locked room that was only accessible in a few different places, a few different people if they had the right keys, and we've been able to turn it into a collection which is available for everyone to engage with. It's absolutely fabulous and I think you'll agree. It's a wondrous space and I hope that you are enjoying it all. Oh, hello, hello Lorraine, hello Clive, hello Alex. Alexis. Hello everyone. Jerry, thank you so much indeed for tuning in. It's great to see you all. So thank you for your great questions that you've been sending in in the interim while we uh, have been having our kind of uh, interpose uh, between Q&As. Hello Tracy, hello Elizabeth, hello Anne, hello everyone. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. Um, and I have, you know, it's such as ever a difficult decision deciding which questions um, to focus in on as they are all of course so absolutely brilliant. Hello Linda from sunny Paros. Linda is coming to us from Greece. Wow, where it's seven o'clock in the evening. I hope in Greece, I hope that you have a decent uh, beer, a mythos or an alpha, or perhaps even a beer fix in your hands, or perhaps an ouzo or something, or a rakia, something like that from Paris, and you're enjoying the sun setting somewhere on a Greek island. Hello, Helen. You're unable to make the lecture later. Oh, what a shame, like kind of thing. Yes, so the other great fun that we are having today is that coming, following on pretty much on the heels of this live Q&A, we are going downstairs to give a big lecture here at the University of Warwick about the gritty realities of the ancient Olympics. So uh, kind of we're particularly putting on that lecture for those who might want to study with us, might want to study with us in part-time rather than full-time capacity. So if uh, kind of you are in the Coventry area and are at a loss, it's not too late. Come and join us. We'll be kicking off about 6.15. Linda says, beer fix, excellent choice. Excellent choice, Linda, of beer. Uh, that is the only Greek beer to be drinking um, in my mind. Hello to Swansea, Carolyn Swansea. Hello to Lorraine in Calgary, Calendar. Thank you indeed so much for tuning in. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see you all here. And kind of, yes, absolutely, beer fix is the way to go. Helen says, wish I was in Paros. I'm sure we all do. Linda, you might be getting a few stabbing pains of jealousy coming at you. Um, Deborah from Wigan. Uh, Juan from Argentina. Shelley, good afternoon. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Mariam. How are you? Lovely to see you all. Thank you all so much for tuning in. So let's kick off with one of your questions. And this is from uh, Ute Stenkamp, who comes from Germany, who's been getting in touch now uh, and wants to know particularly about one of the Titans. So one of the pre-Olympian deities, the generation before Zeus and Hera and Apollo and Artemis and Aphrodite and Dionysus uh, and all of those things. Clive, please don't say anything against the clock. The clock is absolutely a staple and will be returning. Don't you worry, uh, indeed. The clock will be back very, very soon. Um, but Uta has been asking about the Titan Thea. Uh, now, I uh, would like to know a little bit more about Thea. And it gives some good, really interesting background here about um, kind of why they're interested, uh, and he's particularly interested in uh, this character of Thayer, because they've actually set up an association called Thayer International um, for the potential development of young people, and they liked kind of the, some of the associations of Thayer exactly. So, um, kind of, we need to think a little bit more about who is this Titan Thayer. Now, remember, and I kind of, if you're thinking about the gods, you've got Uranus and Gaia. Right, who are the two kind of primordial gods from which everything else descends. So you've got Uranus of the ocean. Uh, sorry, what am I talking about? Uranus, the sky, the heavens, and Gaia, 
the earth, right? So you've got these two primordial deities that together produce the Titans, the next generation of gods, of which Thea is one. And then it's the offspring of them, and particularly one of them, Kronos, um, that will kind of then give birth to Zeus and to all the other gods. Helen, yes, you love the artifacts displayed. Alexis, team clock all the way. Brilliant, nice, nice to see you. So, Uranus and Gaia, heaven and earth coming together to create Thea. Now, that's T-H-E-I-A. Now, if we break that down in the Greek, that comes sort of two, there's two different meanings to Thea. One is to do with Thea, which is sight, ability to see, but there's also a sense of theasdo, which is about prophecy, right? So an inspiration. So in some ways, it's both about sight, sight into the future for prophecy and inspiration. But this is what the goddess Thea, or rather the Titan Thea, I should say, is all about. Now, this chimes in with the kind of theories in the antiquity of how people actually saw stuff. Um, and the idea that the eye was a, an emitter shooting out rays of invisible light to then touch objects which then rebounded back to allow you to see. So it wasn't that there was light out there that the eye was being receptive to, it was the eye was actually the instigator of sending out that light. Um, so you can start to see how Thea sight also ends up being the titan responsible for light. Right? And it is supposedly from Thea that all light proceeds. Right? She is the titan that brings light into the world. Um, and so you often see Thea also associated with shining in the sky. Uh, and you can also, she's talked about in terms of wide shining. That's another of her kind of epithets or names, but also tracing, tracking. So again, this interplay between the ideas of sight and prophecy and inspiration. Deborah, glad you love the clock. Diane from Shrewsbury High Greek Club. Lovely to see. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you all, wherever you are in the world, have a beer fix in your hand or at least um, some good drink to be able to enjoy while we're listening in. Now, who are the children of Thea? Well, she actually gets together with another Titan, another Titan brother. I know it's all a bit incestuous, but that's the way of the Greek gods, absolutely fine. To produce three children, Helios, the sun, Eos, dawn, and Selenus, the moon. So again, all those elements of light from morning, dawn, through high point of the day, sun, through to Thanos, the moon. So fair, really interesting Titan. And I love the idea that you can associate, Nuta has been doing this with, with their project, looking at thinking about how Thea as a name is about bringing light to the world, bringing inspiration to the world, and particularly to young people, shining light on the different potential things that these people could go on to do. Um, and so kind of, it's a really nice sort of connection, I think, um, between the two. Annalise coming in from Australia, lovely to see you. What time is it with you, Annalise, in Australia? Lovely, lovely, lovely that you could join us. Thank you so much indeed for tuning in. Um, and one of my particular favorites about Thea is there is actually a supposed planet Thea. Uta, so great that you're here. Thank you so much indeed for joining in. I apologize profusely, um, kind of, uh, kind of for, I, I said I think I've said him once or twice, haven't I? But of course, uh, apologies for not uh, understanding your gender from your name. Um, lovely that you could join us. Absolutely, fairinternational.org if people are interested in learning more about this organisation and bringing in the fact that kind of I one of the facts I love about Fair is absolutely brilliant is that there is a supposed ancient planet so that's, that's hypothesised that they've named Fair, which is supposed to have bashed into the Earth about four and a half billion years ago. Um, and and it's from the debris created from that uh, that clash um, that the moon was supposed to then have been formed. So Thea as a planet gave rise to another moon, our moon, Selena, just as Thea in Greek antiquity is supposed to have given rise to Selena, the moon. Um, so this idea, I think, of Thea as light, as prophecy, as inspiration, as shining her light so that we can all see better where we are going in the future. Absolutely brilliant. John, you're watching the tennis. I am disappointed in you. I honestly am. Um, anyway, thank you so much indeed for your question. Great, good luck with your organisation. Do let us know how it goes. Um, uh, and uh, kind of what is certainly Anna Lee in Australia. It's 2 a.m. with you. Wow, thank you so much indeed for getting up. Or maybe you're just coming in from a night out and you thought this was the way to wind down um, at the end of a great night out on the town uh, to come and listen to a little bit of Ancient World, Ancient World's Q&A. Welcome, you are very, very welcome. So you've got the moon with you. Uh, another one of Thayer's children, but the light will be coming soon. 
Okay, so we move from Ute talking about Thea to another divine question coming in from William Moulton. Where did Nectar and Ambrosia come from and what's it all about? Nectar and Ambrosia. Oh, William, well, now there we are. Uh, kind of this is very much the drink, of course, of the gods. Well, it's a, there's a lot of confusion, actually, William, in the sources. It's all a bit of a mess. And to that question you asked, where did they come from? There is not a good answer at all. They just seem to be there as terms that are going back way, 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 way in the ancient Greek and even into ancient Sanskrit. So nectar has been sort of, by linguists, has been sort of broken apart into the neck and the tor and neck death. Tor that uh, has a root of words of overcoming. So this idea of overcoming immortality. Yes, Alexis, rice pudding, ambrosia rice pudding, that is exactly what we are talking about. Um, and then with ambrosia, kind of breaking down again into the earliest um, kind of uh, w you know, word roots that we can get at, something along the line, myrtos, the undying. So there is this conception of these words around both nectar and ambrosia, um, that there is a sense that they give immortality. And of course, whether one's a food, one's a drink, sources are already confused about which is which. These are the drinks of the gods. These are the, the essence, what the gods imbibe on. And of course, the supposedly, if you if you imbibe ambrosia and nectar, you lose your human blood and it is replaced by ichor in your veins, right? You are uh, becoming divine and immortal. Uh, Mariam's not having a beer, she's having a mango shake, an excellent choice. And if you can't have that, then why not some ambrosia and some nectar as well? But of course, just be careful because if you're not supposed to be imbibing ambrosia and nectar, then you will be in trouble. Remember Tantalus who tried to give ambrosia to non-immortals to uh, imbibe of and enjoy, and you know what happened to him in continual purgatory of everything that he wanted being just beyond reach, so do so at your peril. Um, but this is the food that uh, is imbibed, and you know, where does it come from? We don't know. It's there from the very beginning. The earliest stories and narratives of the Greek gods that this is what they feast on. Um, Lee, hello, welcome. No worries about being late at all. Um, it seems in some sources to be brought by the gods, brought to the gods by doves. Okay, like kind of thing. But again, it's all really unclear as to where this stuff come from. Brilliant, Diane. Put it together. Amber nectar. That's what we like. Yes, of course. Lots of people have tried to work out. So, what is this ambrosia? What is this nectar? Right? What kind of what? What is it actually physically? What were the Greeks imagining that the gods were eating and drinking? And for some, it's a honey-based liquid, right? A liquid food. So you could have it across that whole consistency range. Um, uh, and that's probably the one that has a little bit more weight behind it. Uh, and then there's also some pretty wacky arguments out there about it basically being forms of magic mushrooms. Uh, and drinks made from magic mushrooms. I will leave that there entirely and we won't go any further with that. Um, but yes, kind of this is the drink of the gods and uh, drink and food of the gods, but we don't know where it comes from, but it is absolutely omnipresence as the thing that def defines who is divine um, and who is mortal. Um, because if you step over that line when you're not supposed to imbibe nectar and ambrosia, you are in trouble. Um, so, William, thank you so much indeed for your question. I'm sorry we can't provide an answer. Sometimes we just don't know. We just don't have the answers from the ancient world at all. Uh, the, the things we'd like to know, and perhaps even the ancients didn't know what the answer was as to where did nectar and ambrosia come from. They just knew that it was there. Lee, etymology, yes. Petrichor, Mark, yes. Hello, welcome from Las Vegas. Um, Helen, wish you'd had <laughs> teachers studying at school. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to share the ancient world with you. This is what I enjoy so much. And as you remember, we are fast approaching our 100th Q&A that we have been working together on since August 2018 when we kicked off. So we may be hitting our 100th Q&A in time for August 2022. Four years on 100 Q&As, your amazing questions, the absolute delight and centerpiece of the Q&A. Shelley, cranberry juice on the go. Excellent cider tomorrow night. Excellent choices all round, all round. So let's take a quick break from the questions because and just say a little bit about all the amazing things that have been discovered, found. We do 
classics in the news section and then we'll think a little bit about classics upcoming events and podcasts that you might want to get into hello patricia lovely to see you too hello tom um thank you so much for joining in so i particularly enjoyed this from the smithsonian magazine all of these of course are on the facebook page so you can check out the links um, and we'll re 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 a post there i can't speak it's been the end of a long day we'll repost some of the the favorites as, as part of the roundup of this q a but scientists recreate cleopatra's favorite perfume yes we have been bringing together all the aspects of uh, the favorite perfume of cleopatra um, and uh, kind of actually determining what ingredients made up real ancient perfumes isn't as easy as it might seem. No, I suspect it is not in any way, shape or form, but you can read the Smithsonian Magazine for the journey they've been on. Um, then we move slightly from the sublime to the ridiculous, but um, a kind of Russell Crowe, Zeus, entering the Marvel Universe. What do we think about all this? Yes. So, of course, we've had Thor. Thor has brought in uh, the gods of ancient Egypt. They're just as real. So we've had Asgard's Norse gods, right? Now we're bringing in the gods of ancient Egypt. And soon, right, in the teaser for Thor, Love and Thunder, Russell Crowe is coming in as Zeus. Wow. Linda, the Archaeological Museum on Delos is closed until further notice. Oh no! What's happened? Do you know? Do we know any further information? This is serious. It's one of the best museums around. But still go to Delos, to the island, if you can, to see the site. Um, even though you might not be able to go in to see the museum. What a shame! Oh no! Oh no! Uh, maybe Russell Crowe as Zeus can sort it out for us. Yes, um, the former gladiator, now leader of the Olympians, may not be as immortal as he thinks. Dun dun. Da. Yes, Russell Crowe, keep your ears peeled. He's going to be in the Marvel Universe. It's going to be brilliant. Ancient Greek graduate school yearbook was discovered on a marble slab. I love this. So this is a group of 31 me ne young men who did a year of military training together. They were ephebes, which is the name for the sort of technical young on the cusp of adulthood when they get sent based off basically off for their national service. And as a gang, they all inscribed their name um, on this stone. But the extraordinary thing about this stone is that it's been sitting in the National Museum Scotland collection for more than a hundred years in storage, right? Kind of, um, and it dates back to the first century AD. We're only just kind of realizing the stuff that's actually been there under our noses. So many amazing things sitting in the storage rooms. Linda, I can imagine you were miffed not being able to get to the Delos Museum, I can imagine. Um, the Romans may have got further into Wales than we ever thought. You'd like Russell Crowe rather than Russell Brand, Alexis. I would agree with that, but I'm not sure of the two I'd go with either, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'll see. What what Russell Crowe can do with Zeus but am I ever going to be able to look past Gladiator when I'm looking at Russell Crowe and see anyone except are you entertained I kind of you know I hope Zeus doesn't say anything like that in the next Marvel film the Romans ventured deeper into Wales than ever thought ever thought this is really interesting so the Romans obviously got into Wales to places like Caerleon where there's a Roman camp and Roman theatre it's all very Roman and then traditionally thought going further west actually they were more engaging with the native tribes maybe helping them out with a bit of architecture you get start to see sort of Roman-esque kind of forums of local communities, but not necessarily themselves being present in the long term. But now roads have been found um, that seem to show that the Romans were really getting out there all the way through to the coast. This is really, really fascinating indeed. Then the Observer talks about the mass frog burial. Absolutely, we do like a bit of a mystery burial. The mass frog burial at an Iron Age site dating from around, well, either between 400 BC and AD 43, uh, where there are the bones of 8,000 frogs piled up together. They're recovered from a single 14 meter long ditch right next to the site of an Iron Age roundhouse at Bar Hill near Cambridge. Wow. 8,000 frogs. What are we supposed to do with that? I kind of, that is really quite something. So, uh, 8,000 frogs. Have you got some ideas? Why were 8,000 frogs all buried together? Kind of, what, how do we explain this? It reminds me of a grave that was found um, in, in the near, very much the Agora of Athens. It dates from the Hellenistic period, first, second century BC, if I remember rightly. But it was filled with children's bones and dog bones. 
Patricia, thank you for the enthusiasm today. Kind of like, it's a lovely to be back with you. I've missed you all. Hello, John. Oh, good morning, good morning, good morning, good afternoon. Where are you in the world, John? Tell us who, where you are in the world, if it's good morning for you. So, um, frog bones in Bar Hill, Cambridge. Uh, Athens, lots of dog bones mixed in with children's bones. So how do we explain this like kind of thing? So with the children's bones in Athens, they all seem to be children who have died of natural causes. This is not uh, killing a lot of children in Athens. Natural causes where they've all had things like quite deformed cleft palates um, and it, they would have as a result not have been able to feed and nourish properly and, and died of natural causes while in their youth. So were the dogs family household dogs that were then sacrificed with them alongside them um, in order to accompany them into the afterlife, to look after them. Ar William, Aristophanes is protect. Yes, Diane, Brecker, Kekex, Coax, Coax, frog bones. Maybe they were all big fans of Aristophanes' frogs. Absolutely. Who knows what was going on? Um, this is absolutely brilliant. 8,000 frogs. That isn't, that isn't an accident, is it? There's got to be a reason. It's got to be a reason. Um, and maybe it's just one of those things that we will never quite get at. Um, if you want to be part of an excavation this summer, get out to Pendle Hill, because the Pendle Hill Landscape Partnership are running a dig from July 18th to July 29th and are welcoming anyone to come and get involved. Tom, you're in California. Lovely. Welcome, welcome. Lovely to have you with us. So get involved in that. Couple more things, because there's just such extraordinary stuff. I mean, if you thought Russell Crowe was bad playing Zeus, have you heard the news that Guy Ritchie is directing the new Hercules film? Now, Disney Hercules is very close to my heart. It is perhaps one of the best films ever made, full stop. And I am nervous about this remake of a real Hercules movie. I am even more nervous, potentially, than with Guy Ritchie directing it. But we will have to see. He's better. Metro goes as quite right they should. The original Hercules was perfect. Guy Ritchie better not mess up the remake. I agree wholeheartedly. Tons of stuff going on over the next couple of weeks um, in terms of podcasts and different festivals. We'll be flagging it all across the Facebook page. Lots of you to get involved, lots of lots for you to get involved with. So please, please, please do. Um, and you know, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna quickly get back to some of your great questions that have coming in. I wanted to, to be able to answer, um, but do get involved over the summer with all the amazing things that there are um, to do. Lots of literary festivals, lots of great people talking about the ancient world, um, lots of excavations, and of course the sites to get out and see while uh, kind of the sun is shining. But even if it's not shining, get out there anyway. Nothing like a sight in the rain, absolutely brilliant. Sarah Scotty's been asking about, what would the Greeks and Romans make of modern day bodybuilders, muscle popping, fake tan, etc. Would it be fitness goals or disgusting to them? Sarah, I have to tell you, the ancient Greeks in particular would be pretty happy with all these modern day bodybuilders. And indeed, they'd even be even more comfortable with all this idea of the post photo um, Adobe touch up stuff that now people do before the photo goes out live on a magazine or on Instagram, etc., to make them even more perfect than the photo captured them to be. So don't forget, we're in a world of the ancient Greeks. If you think about the Olympics, which we'll be talking about later, the gritty reality of the ancient Olympics, where it's surrounded by statues of winners. And when you look at these statues, they are not only muscly and perfect, but actually if you talk to doctors about the anatomy, it shows elements of the anatomy that have been taken beyond what is humanly possible, however long you go to the gym. Gym. Um, so things like the iliac crest, which is the muscle that comes down the front of the pelvis, down to the groin area, and then goes back up the other side. And then in some ancient Greek sculptures, they, they carve it going all the way back to meet at the base of the spine. You can't have that definition of that muscle line all the way around the body, however much you go to the gym. It's not like the Greeks didn't know that. They could perfectly well have carved it more realistically if they wanted to, but they wanted absolutely uber perfect, uber realistic, totally over the top human bodies as that inspiration um, for, their, for, 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 for their own striving for constant perfection. And indeed as well, they would have been as a result of that kind of uber, that love of uber perfection, uber reality, totally happy with the idea of the touch up culture where we're turning ourselves into more than we really ever are in reality. Uh, and it was kind of quite a horrific and pressurized environment as a result that the ancient Greeks put them in. 
then. For the Romans, slightly different because the Romans weren't so interested necessarily in sculpture and art in your body. That wasn't where your real character lay. It was in your face that your real character lay. And that's where you wanted to be showing things like octoritas, severitas, dignitas, um, through lots of wrinkles and wizened lines to show that you had real experience and seniority. That's what the Romans were looking for, at least in their art and sculpture. Um, so uh, kind of kind of Sarah, I'm afraid modern day bodybuilders and all of that touch up culture, all the airbrushing, very much part of the Greek world. Now, we've had two questions we can just get an answer to talking about the ancient symposium, both reacting to the symposium episode of the ancients that we did for History Hit Ancients podcast. We're in this very room. You may well recognize the background. Um, Tracy Rabiotti and Alexis Brown have been asking a couple of different questions. Uh, Alexis, you've been asking about whether the Kylix, that kind of wine brim drinking cup which you can see an example just there behind me turned upside down in one of the cabinets um, so people can look at the images would that have been used just as a symposium at the symposium would they have used a more recognizable style normal drinking cup for everyday drinking yes absolutely so the kylix is very much the kind of creme de la creme of what you bring out for your symposium drinking party but in normal kind of just day-to-day -day drinking would have definitely been different types and simpler types of cups now if i do a slight turn you should hopefully B, if I turn there, can we see? And I go up a little bit. You might be able to see some more cups there that are all just sitting in the cabinet. Those are some of the more normal shaped cups and little bowls for food and for drink. There's a drink one um, at the front there. So you get a sense of those different kinds. And then if we go up to the section behind me, if I put this down again, um, just above my head, there is another kind of drinking cup which is a sort of normal shape one, but then has the handles, little handles on both sides that you could hold or hold it around. So you could easily kind of clasp it in a single hand. Um, so yes, definitely there would have been lots of different shapes of cups for the more normal occasions. Um, but when you did the symposium, nothing but the Kylix would do. And you're also asking, how do they get the wine from the huge craters into the smaller vessels for pouring? Do they use a ladle? Yes, absolutely. So you've got the big crater where the wine is mixed, and then that would be ladled out into the amphora um, or kind of the amphora, the kind of, well, sometimes that one, but also then kind of there would have been the inokwe, the wine jugs, there would have been the smaller jugs that the slaves could then carry around to fill up um, uh, everyone's individual glass. Jenny's asking, we join late, where are you? I am in the antiquities room of the Department of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Warwick, and this is our antiquities collection um, that we have now here on display for everyone to come and have a look at when they're coming to visit the new Faculty of Arts building, Jenny. No worries at all, glad you could join us. Um, and Lee, fab, fab. Yes, indeed, it's fab. The Faculty of Arts building is fab. And we will just simply see, leave it at that. Do you know what we managed to do? We managed to convince the powers that would be to call the open uh, entry space of the Faculty of Arts building on the ground floor, big open space, which can be used for events and people can come together. I'll give you one guess what we've managed to convince them to call it. Put your guesses on the chat now. What have we managed to get them to call it? You've got about a minute or two to get your guesses in there um, before this is a building dedicated to all arts and humanities subjects at the University of Warwick. Of course, that's across multiple languages, across multiple cultures. But what have we managed to convince them to do? The big open space where people can gather together uh, to uh, get uh, be part of events and also just to socialize and to meet people. Uh, <laughs> no. Ah, oh, Tracy. You've won it already. Debbie, you're right, you're spot on. I feel like doing one of these great radio quizzes. Alexis, the Michael Scott atrium. No, although, Alexis, you do remind me to tell you about the Delphi Garden, which some of you may have seen and we talked about in the kind of uh, recent um, kind of Q&As. There is, in fact, now the Delphi Garden, a space of inspiration and relaxation and self-reflection just outside the Faculty of Arts building. Come and have a look with trees from Delphi that were given and gifted to the university by the UK Press Association in honour of my work on Delphi. Um, so there is a kind of a little bit of a Michael Garden um, along Delphi Garden of self-reflection self and inspiration just 
outside. Nassim Agarar, Bill Agarar, Jenny Agarar. Agarar is the name. Yes, we managed to convince everyone to call it the Agarar. Panix would have been another good one. I think we might have had a harder job convincing people of that because it's a harder word to say if you're not used to it. Yes, it is the Agora, absolutely. The Greek world is completely imbued in this building. And you may remember back some time ago to when they first started building this building, there is actually Greek libations poured into the underground foundations of this building to ensure that the pagan Greek gods are on our side. Lee, grow thyself, absolutely indeed. That's what we like to see. Um, so we, you can imagine that all the, uh, the, the, the workmen from the building site who all came to this ceremony, um, they've been to millions of these kinds of ceremonies, I'm sure in the past collectively between them, but I'm pretty sure they'd also never seen one like this where libations were poured to the gods with wine and honey. Very quickly, Tracy, before we finish off, uh, you're also talking about the episode of the ancients and loving the idea of fluid dynamics and technology being you brought to science and technology becoming part of the study of the ancient world. Absolutely right. This is you know, one of the great avenues forward um, that we're using not only is the, the technologies to examine materials, to be able to find out more things about the materials themselves at a microscopic level, where they come from, what the constituencies are, etc. We're using the laser scanning to be able to understand that world and put it together better than ever before. But also one of the things I'm really fascinated at the moment is using a lot of cognitive behavioural science approaches um, to be able to understand how the human brain works, which hasn't changed, of course, in 2000 years. And we can then actually start to understand a little bit more about how ancients would have reacted to things. So in situations where we don't have those literary sources telling us about stuff and we want to try and get into the headspace of the individual um, ancient Greek, then we can start to use those cognitive behavioural science approaches as well. So we can bring science and technology to the study of the ancient world in droves. Now, uh, we are out of time. We are out of time. Uh, Rachel Campbell, I haven't got to your question about Achilles' character in Ephigenia and Alice. We will do this next time, I promise you. Next time, when is it going to be? 14th of July at 5pm. So only two weeks to wait. 14th of July, 5pm UK time. We will be here, sadly not here in the University in the Antiquities room. We may well be back in front of my clock. Uh, so, you lucky things. Uh, we will see you next time on the 14th of July at 5pm. I think that might be number 98 or 99 of the podcast when we meet on the 4th 14th of July. Claire might be able to let us know. We are in countdown mode to the round 100. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you for your time as always. Hope to see perhaps some of you if for the lecture in a little bit. Um, and in the meantime, and until the 14th of July, stay safe. Keep sending in your questions. Keep sending in your questions. You can send them to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com or you can send them in via the Facebook page. Claire, next time. Thank you. 14th of July, 99. 14th of July will be podcast 99. We are almost there. Thank you so much all for tuning in from across the world, from everywhere, from Las Vegas, California, all the way through to Australia. It's a wonder to have this chance to speak with you all. Take care of yourselves and see you all soon. Bye.